Looking good here. All right, good. Um, so I'm going to do this from inside of my browser. Uh, this is a newly formed alpha Ubuntu box, so it's going to be a bit tricky today. But in a nutshell, uh, welcome to my presentation. My name is Ron Brash. Uh, this is about GPS, SDRs, implications, and ICS. It's far more than what you kind of been thinking about. GPS hacking and, and kind of this whole concept of spoofing has been known in the academic and even the recent, well, in most of the red teaming communities for quite some time. But the actual end applications of it in terms of regular risk, instead of just looking for your location on Google Maps, it's a lot, it's a lot grander in scale. So really with the, this advent of commoditized technology, all these connected devices, you're getting increased risk uh, via GPS and SDR. So Really what I, what I want to do with this kind of crisis con conversation is to start thinking this through properly. Perfect. So of course, uh, no presentation would be uh, without a disclaimer. These opinions are my own and observations I have made do not represent those of my employer, partners, past, present, future clients and engagements. Please be responsible, especially if you happen to live near an airport uh, with an SDR. So kind of it's going to fall down to this is I'm going to introduce uh, RF signals. I'm going to talk about the rise of SDRs in affordable RF tech. Um, again, I, I make no promises that I'm the absolute uh, expert at this. There's too much to know. Uh, threats and critical infrastructure and also those in regards to aviation. So I'll throw in a few there. I'm reusing part of this deck. Uh, potential mitigation strategies or at least things to be aware of from product developer side to the asset owners themselves or integrators, a demo and uh, maybe some conversations about moving forward. So who am I? Well, uh, I'm a director of cybersecurity insights of Urban Industrial. I was an ex Tofino uh, security developer. So I did deep back inspection. I've worked uh, for over 10 and a half years now in the industrial critical infrastructure space. I've advised uh, various organizations uh, for critical infrastructure. Uh, I'm a PCAP jock. PCAP jockey, so if you ever need PCAPs of something or to rip something apart, probably I'll be the guy to go to. Uh, researcher, consultant, and technical director. In a previous life, I was an embedded product development for ICS, but also for neuroscience. So that's where I got most of my exposure to early on signal analysis, which doesn't really change between the brain or over the waves. Uh, I created the ICS detection challenge. I have a bachelor's in technology from PCIT in Vancouver and I have a master's in computer science from Concordia University here in Montreal. So in a nutshell, RF Signals 101. Signals, basics, and fields and waves. So electric and magnetics are present even if voltage and current remain constant. So whether or not uh, you have fluctuations of a signal, there's always something there, but they wouldn't propagate. So propagate, I think, is uh, you know, from something that's coming from you onwards, outwards. So to do that, you need to modulate it so that way you get a variation. In other words, uh, this modulation is, the is due to the relationship between the electronic or electro and magnetic components of, of that wave. So think of it that way is that a changing electric field generates a magnetic wave and a changing magnetic wave or field generates an electric field. So basically they come together and they become electromagnetic wave. This is uh, kind of signal analysis 101, whether you're working uh, with embedded components or you're working with uh, AC versus DC. Um, AC is that exact same reference, right? Without any belt modulation, DC is, the, is gonna be basically uh, a linear line at a certain amplitude. But with that variation like we have with AC, you'll, you'll see that wave uh, traveling upwards. So in short, uh, signals, come across frequency domains. And frequency domains are a main piece of uh, when you're doing RF design, analysis, and testing. So it's a fundamental. It's what you're really wanting to think about is frequency domains versus signals and remaining within the context of voltages and currents that either are static or dynamic with respect to time. So time series analysis is one of the things you'll probably end up using more often than not. When you're, you're measuring things with a multimeter, right, you get a, a static quantity. But if you're looking on an oscilloscope, right, you'll see those waves I was just talking about, right? You'll see a sinus, that's a sinusoidal voltage. But again, just knowing these two things doesn't provide adequate context for our usage, right? I mean, if you're trying to figure out uh, like the great award winning uh, Monta Elkins when he's doing uh, his hardware hacking uh, on the other previous crisis con, uh, presentation, 
right? He, he's not necessarily looking for, for a wave, although he might if he's using a tool like a bus pirate to see if there's a UR pin. Uh, or like, for example, if you're looking for SPI, right? Um, you, need more, you need more here. So when you want it to get more information about this, you need to look over, over the entire frequency domain of, the signal, of, of waves and signals that you're looking for that you really want to capture. And once you capture them, you still gotta do something with them. And that's the decode and encode functions. But you still need to be aware of your signal to noise ratios. And you'll see that later with the demonstration. So in signals basics, uh, you have confusing metrics with decibel. Uh, trust me, there's dB this, dB that uh, in reference. You have, it's, it's effectively just a, a method of expressing ratios between two quantities. But they're inherently relative, and then absolute qualities can be expressive on a dB scale by using units that, that use a reference. So generally speaking, if you're looking in the signals realm uh, for RF, the most common absolute dB unit is the dBm, which conveys the decibel uh, power of a signal with respect to a reference one milliwatt of power. dBc expresses power with respect to the power of the related signal, so that's your carrier reference signal. And then generally, uh, you'll talk about things like the power gain or simply gain as a key performance number that com combines the antenna's directivity, so where it's directed, whether it's uh, omniscient or it's pointed, and also its electrical efficiency. And then DBI finally is the unit that expresses the gain of an antenna relative to the response of an idealized point source antenna, so an academically perfect uh, reference. So in short, uh, signals, uh, they require decoding and encoding. So the decoding aims to extract the binary bits uh, from the received wavelength form. So even if you did jam uh, a signal by, you know, flooding it, just, you know, flooding uh, and filtering out everything around you, there might not be anything inside of it. Um, but really what you want, that, and that, that could be a, a theoretically possible and very likely attack scenario that you might do if you're an attacker. Um, or you want to give them falsified bits inside of it, and that requires this other piece here. But effectively, uh, if you're recording a wireless transmission to view its waveform, you need to know the modulation type. So how the signal appears, is it using CDMA? Is it, you know, is it doing all sorts of things to, to get more data out of a signal, right? Because you might wind up with uh, what we call the walkie talkie or the cocktail problem. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, embedded systems or RF or even, you know, basic uh, operations with radios, if you have two radio sources that are sending out on the exact same uh, frequency, they'll cancel each other out. So that's often uh, something that you want to deal with in the cocktail problem, as it's often called. So you'll end up using different modulization schemas and demodulization so that a receiver can differentiate between the speakers. Uh, and that's what GPS does. So overall, some receivers use very difficult mechanisms to modulate uh, the data and encode it in the outbound signal or also uh, receive it, right? If you have uh, variable frequency channel hopping, uh, such as you do with Bluetooth, for example. You need to also consider uh, the synchronization between the data and the signal, so time allotments. Uh, you might want to use a digital filter to improve signal quality or a specialized antenna. Uh, amplification as well. And then you might again, like I said, use advanced techniques. So the overall basics for this premise is around the concept of agility. Electromagnetic uh, is the dominant form of communication, especially if you're doing on the radio frequency. So when compared to light, it's, it, you know, it's, you're not bound uh, by lines of sight or things like that. I can get through walls depending on, on the frequency and its, and its properties uh, from the physics side of things. But the general generality is about the agility, the speed, and the range. And GPS has been one of those things that is entirely tied to agility. It's gotten to the point where it's, it's quite quick. Uh, you can also deal with great range, right? So they've gotten down to the point that we can measure in millimeters or even do uh, earthquake analysis with some, with some GPS receivers because they're so sensitive. So it's not just like it used to be the, the 30 meters accuracy or three meters accuracy. Uh, there's all sorts of new technologies that are enabled in there, some of which came from the aviation space and others came from military backgrounds or just the commoditization of technology. Now, when you're dealing with uh, these measurement tools, you have a number of frequencies and based on which frequencies you wish to analyze you'll probably choose your tool accordingly and so this is particularly true for gps too and and thankfully if you're wanting to play around with gps i 
almost every SDR will do exactly what you want, assuming that you have a temperature controlled uh, oscillating uh, crystal. So there's three main categories of how you'll do your analysis. You have your, your spectral analysis, your vector analysis, and your network analysis. Spectrum analysis is going to be what we're going to see later on. Uh, you're going to be able to see things such as my, just as you know where you where my where I'm generating the signal versus my background noise. Uh, vector instruments are real time analyzers that will capture everything, so they're not just uh, dropping samples or they are uh, doing limited things. Uh, I'm only really looking at one vector here. And then network analysis can look at all sorts of things. Uh, these are very very expensive units, but the main piece that you want to really recognize is you want a device that can uh, that can capture anything you know from from 20 or even 100 megahertz onwards to uh, 2.4 gigahertz. And again, this is almost all of the SDRs can do this. So in summary, uh, engineers can track with signals over time domain or frequency domain. Frequency domain analysis naturally suppresses details that are often of little importance. So don't worry too much that you're skipping a bunch of features in your data set. But at the same time, it emphasizes the characteristics we need to look on, and that's what we need to do for GPS. And in, in short, uh, if you can get a spectrum analyzer, which is pretty cheap these days with SDR, uh, you're going to have a good time. So speaking of having a good time for cheap, software-defined radios and related tech. This is my favorite slide, really. Um, Effectively, they're usually microcontrollers uh, with high frequencies. You have FPGAs, uh, given that you can do all these sort of software programmable blocks, uh, and, and then that way you can do software tunable things that you never were able to do before. Originally, uh, things from this realm came from audio backgrounds, and that was for you know mixers, amplifiers, uh, but then, you know, it kind of come across to the ham radio groups, and then you had, and your hobbyists, and then also, too, because of their flexibility, the military uh, enthusiasts and government all caught on. So now it's commonly available, and it's pretty cheap. So uh, right now on my desk, I have two HackRF uh, devices that are, that were obtained from Hack5, Hack5 ships to Canada, apparently. Um, then you have your Kerberos SDR, which actually has four antennas, which is useful for localization of signal. You need four, typically, if you can't, if, unless you have one uh, of the equations solved for doing localization. The Lime SDR, which is uh, useful for making your own LTE, it's, it's capable of doing your own LTE networks. And then the Blade RF SDR is capable for LTE, but uh, various other things. But again, it will depend on what you're looking for in your ADCs and stuff like that. So like I said, the projects around this, and this is where the hacking really starts to come into it. And this is uh, either for you know, the original definitions of hacking being a curious individual or otherwise. Uh, operators, uh, if you know, people that are curious with signal interception, whether that's from the from aviation side of things, so that'd be ACARS, ADSB, uh, GPS, weather beacons, automated lighting systems. You can look at this from the IoT side of things if you're looking for LoRaWAN gateways, although that's sub gigahertz, so you should be able to pick that up with the right antenna. LTE experimentation, experimentation and spoofing signals. And this is all sorts of projects out there. There's uh, open source signal anal analyzers. Um, you know, there's, if you wanna track uh, planes in orbit or where the satellites are. If you want to, actually I just read an article on this, I believe it was on the Hackaday, using SDR even to test uh, the quality of your fancy dancy audio feel cable. So you can, uh, you can do all sorts of stuff with SDRs. It's just basically a signal analyzer. So in a nutshell, what we're really here today for is GPS and GNSS. So a brief history, uh, GPS as it came from around was a technology that resulted from pretty much the Cold War. So even as today, as we have these two titans uh, battling it out, whether it's Russia or United States or China or take your pick of any other nations that's doing battling out, uh, GPS has benefited society in a number of regards. We have all sorts of tracking, we have automation, we have um, you know the satellite technology that goes in behind it. So we have all these these great things about it. But the protocol is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's been around. Most of the satellites went up 
in the late 70s and there's several or many in the 1980s and up until even today. The protocol, uh, the G well for each GPS satellite, they continuously broadcast a navigation message on the L1 brands, bands. Uh, this is the 1.475, no 1.575, sorry, gigahertz, uh, megahertz band, uh, plus or minus. And then L2 is uh, a little bit different, but not everybody uses L2, and it does about 50 bits per second. The messages uh, are often about 1500 bytes, or bits, sorry, uh, long, and there's about five subframes, and those five subframes get sent uh, about five times each. And then you get required that, so therefore you get a rough, uh, a rough transmission of 25 full frames. And at a GPS transmission rate, uh, you have about 750 seconds to transmit your entire, what's called an almanac. So that is your entire time and locations based on where you are. And each satellite is what's called stratum zero. Stratum zero means it has an atomic clock. Uh, when you use a GPS receiver, you're stratum one, and hopefully your GPS receiver is also dishing out NTP, for example. That'll be stratum one as well. So when you receive all this message, you need to quickly demodulate uh, the message from each satellite that's in its, it, it's in its uh, hemisphere, or at least in its line of sight for the antenna. Now, you gotta remember that, then this is just like neuroscience in regard, physics, physics have a huge play here. So the signal to noise ratio between a satellite and Earth is going to be humongous over the background uh, environment or signal range. It's the same for neuroscience where the skull gets in the way and your muscles actually output more electromagnetic uh, features than does your actual neurons inside your brain. So what you need to do is you need to also consider that you're gonna have all these noisy sources, they're all gonna have a very high uh, signal noise ratio and there's a, a key heuristic there to be looking for spoofing or jamming. Um, towards getting together all those messages. And then what you gotta do is if you receive, you know, let's say, uh, at, well, at a minimum for GPS to work, you need four satellites, but there's caveats there. If you're on the ocean, you only need three because you already know your, your height uh, for the most part. A lot, like if you have one of, one of the, the four uh, areas already solved. But each satellite will then use CDMA, so that way uh, you're not, you don't have the cocktail problem. And that way receivers can distinguish between each satellite from each other. And there's two types. There's the the course acquisition mode, which is the version that we typically get to deal with, and precise code, which is encrypted, uh, and unless you have the keys, you're out of luck. So here's those frequencies that I was talking about. So L1 is the one we're gonna, I'm gonna quickly show you here. Uh, it works very well on the receiver that I have uh, kicking around on the wall behind me. And uh, we'll, we'll see in a, in a short thing, but uh, GPS satellites since 1980 all came with uh, nuclear detonation detection, uh, NUDET, which is pretty cool. Um, and then also too, there's a bunch of other uh, bands that are being played with, whether you're for uh, GLOW, GLONASS, Baidu, uh, and some of the other um, GPS uh, frameworks, I shouldn't say frameworks, but basically the, cover, the, the government uh, derived uh, format. So the threats in, I, in OT and critical infrastructure are a bit different. Now, before I jump into operational technologies or critical infrastructure, GPS has a humongous play in traditional information technology, and it has an even bigger play in financial trading. And those are two very, very important parts here. So if you're coming from an IT background, it's still important to realize where you get your time and what you do with it are very important to you because you may face uh, compliance issues there or any sort of legislation if your logs are uh, not aligned or you have trades arriving out of order. So do keep that in mind that this just isn't for, for infrastructure or aircraft or finding you know where my keys are uh, if I had a little GPS dongle on them or my phone. It is more than that and the threats happen in different regards. So I did mention that I would reuse part of my deck. Uh, this is the aviation ecosystem. You have GPS and time related things everywhere. You have the avionics. You have the comms from the planes, the synchronization to ground avoidance systems. You have, uh, you have even the certificates on laptops and hangers. You have time-related things all over the board, whether that's you know, when tickets are issued, uh, chain of commands. Uh, you also have the infrastructure on the ground. I've seen custody transfers. 
between an airport and a pipeline. There's always a time related to those things. So time and GPS are everywhere, whether that's sort of tracking of assets on the ground or people to, to things in the air, GPS and time is somewhere and everywhere. Well, how about this? So time, it's literally everywhere. So this is Vancouver Airport uh, and the infrastructure that goes around it, for example. So you have a barge terminal uh, and it's gonna have flow meters, it's gonna have GPS uplinks, it's gonna use NTP for time synchronization if there's a, if there's a VPN tunnel or for remote access if you're using TLS keys or TLS and related infrastructure. Inside of her, the Burnaby refinery, which is a relatively small refinery today, you'll have process control equipment that requires or specifies time, uh, at least for, for relative establishment. You'll have remote access for connectivity for third parties. You'll have processors and, and data links. Inside of a control center, a YVR, right? You'll have custody transfers. Maybe you'll have stuff over LT and GSM. Uh, you'll have laptops, BYODs, and then on the, in the fourth picture, you have a pipeline which actually uh, connects the airport to, to that barge terminal for custody transfers, metering information, and so on. Now, I didn't mention, though, that on the first picture, uh, if you're not having GPS for shipping, it actually represents several other problems. Where is that ship? Is it properly broadcasting where it should be in, in the Maritimes, particularly in Singapore, and also, I guess, in, the, in uh, some of the areas that are in contested waters with Iran or with Russia, you also see this uh, dependency on, on GPS, but that's for different reasons. But when you're we're dealing with critical infrastructure, particularly the movement of refined product near water, you actually specifically need to know the exact time and place a an incident or an event has occurred. So if I have a pipeline uh, that's going out to a deep sea terminal, I, and I have two uh, meters, you know, let's say they're uh, one kilometer apart, or actually 1.6 kilometers, so one mile apart, I need to know the exact time uh, between those point A and point B that something has occurred, and that way I can calculate how much product I've lost given a particular time. So it's very, very important for environmental purposes uh, and compliance. Railway. Another humongous uh, consumer of things, all things that are time and locational. Uh, you know, tracking of, of train speed. So if, you know, as the engineer doing something that they're do not supposed to do, so overspeeding, for example, uh, you could be controlling automated systems. So when does it get into the station? Uh, when do I do the emergency shutoffs? When do I, you know, go we'll start rolling and failing over securely or, or cause an operator to, to get involved? We have all of the stuff on the ground, whether that's you know movement of sea cans uh, or freighter or freight or cranes. Those are all will still have probably some sort of aspect on it for timing purposes. So threat breakdowns. They're largely uh, for GPS. You have they kind of break into these five uh, pillars, if we can call them that. We have our physics-driven our physics driven uh, issues, and that's like your line of sight, uh, trade features like fountains. Often, uh, I've heard a lot of people complaining over the last, you know, for at least 10 years until recent systems came online. I couldn't properly track the GPS speed of my boat because I was, uh, I was on a lake surrounded by mountains. Well, of course, um, you need at least four GPS satellites uh, that, can, that can resolve to give you a proper uh, approximation of your location. Um, you have your RF spectrum uh, utilization. So the new bands are being expanded, but if a band uh, is starting to be crowded, will, and especially if there's stronger signals out there, will you uh, be able to deal with your GPS the right way? Fortunately, GPS is not on the 2.4 gigahertz band, so it will not be competing against uh, Wi-Fi. It will not be competing as BLE, Bluetooth, or Zigbee, or any, any of those similar uh, protocols. Weather, uh, GPS doesn't actually have an effect uh, or isn't really affected by weather. Unless there's snow like in a canopy, uh, you know, in trees or potentially uh, you, in theory, you could have a lightning storm. Now lightning storms do have an effect for traditional RF radios in point-to-point uh, -point wireless links. So in theory, uh, you, may, you may deal with things like that or something that simulates one if you have an attacker that is particularly uh, creative. You have spoofing, of course, so uh, anybody with an SDR, a Pringle can or antennas, or especially an amplifier, uh, you can get them pretty cheap these days. 
they, they will basically either confuse or alter the intended function of a receiving device. Uh, my device that I will show you later is particularly con uh, easy to confuse and it actually can fail over into uh, not valid time and just keep trucking on doing whatever it thought it was supposed to do before that. So um, the, basically the premise of, of most of these receivers is the more creative that they get, the more easy it is to cause an unintended effect on GPS which is bad for ICS because we don't want edge cases to take us down. And then jamming, uh, it very simply said, is you just basically saturate the, your target uh, section of the spectrum and either will render it uh, partially blocked or entirely unusable, depending on which applications you're looking. In cases for ICS, there's additional threats around confusing uh, vehicle and asset tracking systems. So, I don't expect a man down system in you know, Fort McMurray on basically a flat horizon uh, to have an issue with GPS jamming. There should be tons of GPSs or satellites uh, within that hemisphere to provide uh, adequate resolution for an individual. Um, but it can disrupt and degrade ground operations, right? So if time failure happens, what do you do? How do you deal with it? This is particularly true for, for aircraft. If a GPS system isn't working, the, no safety has been compromised, but I may not. I may choose to ground the aircraft in that instance. You might have people doing deliberate, deliberate hacker attacks. So GPS can be spoofed. Better receivers can be potentially hacked over the air. So maybe there's a function where if you send a certain message to it, it happens to capture those bytes anyways, and I can do an interesting embedded attack that way through it. Uh, you can also do some other things around the same regards, but in military maneuvers, uh, you can also be showing that you're doing training or experiments. Uh, and, and there's been cases in, in Europe where a certain nation has been doing this for various reasons, whether that's to stop uh, drones or to hide the, the movement of an individual or of several assets, uh, they can have consequences. And that's particularly true for for aircraft on arrival or approach or even takeoff and even flying over some countries in the Middle East, some airlines actually have chosen entirely to bypass that given certain nations are deploying, uh, deploying infrastructure that is capable, or I should say tooling, that is capable of jamming uh, this, this tool that is used by pilots to uh, correctly operate their, their, uh, their aircrafts. Uh, localized GPS, GPS tracking protection. So, you might have people uh, trying to stop drones. So by saturating uh, the GPS uh, band, you can actually stop a, a drone that relies entirely on GPS from being able to navigate to where it needs to. Um, but, but finally, this is really what I want to talk about though, is the compliance concerns. I mentioned with the, the pipeline near water, that is a prime case where you need time, accurate sources of time to ensure that you are compliant. You have reliance on data. So if I manage to change your time and all of your logs look funky, you cannot necessarily test that the integrity of those logs, or at least of the system, behaved exactly as expected at that particular point in time. You can have cases where in 2013, um, Rockwell, I think it was Rockwell Collins, uh, had a heads-up display or some sort of uh, display driver that was in the cockpit of, of aircraft that were, that were uh, deployed with it. And it turned out that if everyone had their cell phones on and they were not airplane mode, uh, you could cause a second heads up display or a display to fail because of the unaccounted RF signals. Uh, you can check out the, the flight airworthiness bulletin for that, for that feature, I think it's dated 2013. Um, but that also can be true for, for other radio, uh, radio gear that's been around since the 1970s or 1980s in unmanned sites for, for drilling works. You might make a case where if I alter the time, your certificates will all expire and, they won't, and none of your hosts will talk to each other. So you will have your VPNs all fail because no one trusts the validation certificates, at least initially. So what do you do in those cases? Or what happens when uh, your, your web server says, your time is completely bonkers to mine, so go away, I'm not dealing with you. And then you also have your embedded systems that are affected. I don't know if everyone knows this, but your time underscore t uh, structure or type is actually might, is not byte aligned in Linux. It's assumed to be a 32-bit uh, field, 
that is at 64 bit. And so this end of the universe, which is coming in 2030, uh, will exist for a long, long time in these embedded systems that are 32 bit ROS or RTOSs or running Linux or VxWorks, depending on how they handle their time. Or your end user applications might be doing timestamps and validating, you know, for periodic checkings. And that might result in unsafe behavior. So be careful there. Uh, and that one I'm particularly afraid of because I think that actually uh, could render a very interesting uh, a attack that will be hard to detect. So I did mention uh, the Bombardi CRJs and me. What did that have to do with me? Well, I was at a I was at a mandate, and interestingly enough, uh, my phone started buzzing, and there was an ETC SEC advisory out uh, for for time I was away, and all of the Bombardier CRJs were not flying in the northeastern hemisphere of the United States and some parts of Canada. Uh, I don't know the exact details of it. I do know there was a, a sensitive document that was published for the, for the right set of eyes. But the, from what I understand is that the, the, a certain selection of satellites was, was played with at that time. And so they were broadcasting out garbage uh, in some cases, or they were actually issuing uh, time uh, that, was, that was encoded for something different. So there was some sort of uh, vulnerability that was being exploited actively on an on said set of satellites. It's just, it is, there's too many flags there that indicate that it was anything sh uh, short of direct involvement and it wasn't an accident or a flaw. And then if you look in the center, um, although this wasn't at the same time, uh, there's been many cases of the, of the Russians uh, playing with GPS and I borrowed that from one of the popular news or online articles, but uh, they were dealing with navigation data. If you look at the screenshot on the right though, this is very interesting. When this, in, when this actual broadcast was occurring, I was not in a place that uh, was having issues with, G, with you know, having tall objects around me. There was very, you know, I had, I had lots of open sky above me. And when I, when I turned off the GPS, or not the GPS on my phone, but the, a lot of the, the extra features for, for pinpointing where I was, interestingly enough, my phone thought I was basically at a beach and I was actually in the middle of that park where the sunglasses are which was quite a distance, it's uh, just shy of a kilometer. So at this exact same time, there's actually a lot of consequences that potentially there where there was, you know, there was ships in the harbor, there was planes on the ground, and who knows what industrial processes and critical infrastructure require time in that particular area. So what I'd like to talk about then is some of the potential mitigation strategies, or at least some, some areas where we can do some improvement moving forward. What I say to people is always trust but validate. And this is true for everything in the critical infrastructure world. If you're relying on time, you should be minimizing uh, or at least engineering towards the effect where you're not going to have an issue with, with time sources coming from your horizon. So there's some devices out there that, are, that, are that add additional layers of protection by filtering the GPS signals that you can receive from satellites. So, it doesn't if it doesn't come from a certain horizon that is typical of a flight path of uh, of a satellite you ignore it right so you know if it's on the, the actual earth's horizon it's probably not a satellite it really isn't and it won't be flying on the same trajectories or if it's constant you can do things like filtering out uh too strong of uh signal to noise ratios right so you most gps simulators uh and here's another good heuristic at least for script kitties they issue 12 GPS satellites. Well, most of the time, in reality, most satellites do not uh, output a very high signal noise ratio. And typically, my receiver won't see that many anyway. So it'll see less than 12. So it'll usually see around six or eight. So you could, you could play with some dependencies there. You can track the constellations. So constellations are referring to the satellites themselves that you're, you're tracking to get your, your resolve time. You can supplement uh, your time with uh, local atomic clocks or multiple GPS arrays, so they so not everyone could particularly uh, tamper your time source. Uh, you could also you you could also fall back to having uh, an NTP pool uh, from somewhere somewhere on the internet if you if you needed relative time, and then you can sync from there. Uh, and then you should also always monitor for changes in your neighborhood. 
in short, though, there's something that we should always consider. So the movement of time in Windows typically is, is set to a certain preamble. So it shouldn't check for time unless there's a, a manual event or a certain frequency is hit. One of your prime jewels to consider is the frequency of which. So if you're not monitoring your, your for changes in, in policy for or time services today, I recommend you should write a use case for this because this is one of the key things that allows me to, to make you go jump into the future way past your, your expiry dates. Um, and then you won't be able to go, there's certain settings that you can't go back or legacy handlings. And that's also the same on the Linux side where you can uh, set up your frequencies and your statistics. So you could have extra data going to your SAM with, with minimal effort. So always look in for monitoring and pre prevent time related config changes on your client side. Uh, and everyone always thinks only about the GPS receivers, but it's actually also about protecting those that are utilizing uh, those time, that time functionality. Time also, again, depends on your networking infrastructure. So monitor and plan accordingly. And I, I recognize that this isn't uh, necessarily a mitigation, but it's part of your mitigation plan. And these are cascading uh, effects after uh, a incident has occurred. You can wind up with denial of service or DDoSs by effect of someone doing GPS spoofing. So that's not because I can't get time and my time source is jammed, but if I have, if my certificates are now invalidated because someone's given me a time that is either really far back uh, in time or really far forward, I can't get VPN connectivity. My TLS certs are down for my, for my internal web servers or for example, my, my help, uh, or if you're doing something like service now, I'm in trouble. Right? I don't have access to my sites when I need access to my sites, particularly if this is just one, uh, one tool that an, that an attacker may be using on you. The other thing is from a mitigation side, we blindly accept time for the most part. We blindly decode it. We don't probably do sanity checks on it as, as we should, although maybe we should do much better. We don't necessarily uh, validate all of the sender information that is being received from the satellites. We're probably not comparing uh, what I call a verdict against the baselines, the alternate time sources, and the expected data that we, what we saw. So if I had a synchronization, let's say uh, five hours ago or three hours ago, and I'd been using you know, those same satellites for the last six months because I ha haven't had a shutdown or a reboot, and all of a sudden, I'm being told that I'm in Japan, which is where I'm going to show you later. And I'm also uh, in a totally different time zone. Something's funky. I should keep using the time I had before that. What do I do? Or do I send that result to an application uh, forward for human involvement or discard that result altogether and uh, try again? How about this embedded test? Well, we don't typically test for time uh, related function in embedded systems. We just assume, oh, the time's good, it received it, system clock is uh, pointing to you know, X, X time in Vancouver, great, uh, move along. Well, in this open wall imp implementation, uh, their extramodal locks had issues with time rolling over because time under store T as a structure in Linux actually is not necessarily 32 bits or 64 bits, uh, depending on your platform. And so, there's assumptions that are made by the compilers that can want, put you in uh, hot water, uh, particularly with rolling over. And there might actually be a case where uh, you might be able to exploit that in, and do some of your own magic slowly over time or cause a crash. So one thing to also do then is to look for where time is being used in your binaries. Um, object dump will probably tell you where you can find some time functions uh, unless they've been scrubbed out or dependencies. So you should be able to look through symbol tables uh, the newer kernels, you know, for the newer ones, 4.0 branches or even five, they're starting to get ready for 64-bit time, so they will be moving over, but many legacy devices will not be. And many embedded systems in critical infrastructure are running really ancient 2.6, 26, or 2.6.8, or 2.8 kernels. Uh, even, you know, some of the very, very early threes, although I typically don't see them, uh, unless maybe they're running a Yocto hybrid, they all have cases where time can be abused. So that's uh, another area that we can consider uh, an interesting mitigation. But at the end of the day, I know we all love technology to solve our problems, but it doesn't necessarily. 
uh, we still need humans. And if we're looking at like, let's say the NIST uh, five wheel here, um, or you're looking at a no ODA model, you still need governance to supplement your, how you do with time. What do you do when your time goes sideways? What do I do when all my certificates expire? Those are all procedures you need to have in place or at least to validate uh, as part of this overall system to handle this, this particular threat scenario when or if it occurs. If you can't engineer out the risk of, uh, of time-related uh, disruption, at least from the product owner side, well, then you need to have a process side to handle it appropriately and, and all of the manual aspects of it uh, in accordance to your risk appetite. That's also true for the OEMs. And you should also test this like you would for every fire, fire drill. It is an event, whether or not it's physical or not, you need to treat it as such. And that make, make sure you kind of have all that covered in your, in your overall uh, guidance and playbooks. So a demo, all right. So it's gonna be a bit tricky. Uh, I know you can't really see everything, so I'll have to take my word a little bit. I have the same laptop in front of you, uh, I think bad, uh, running the HackRF software. I have two HackRF ones plugged in. Um, they're not my favorite devices right now on the, the newest uh, Ubuntu kernel or release of 20.04, there's some breaks. Uh, I have a NetBurner GPS device. They're pretty cheap. They're about 300 bucks. Uh, it does have some interesting features and I'll talk about those as we go. Uh, it also hosts a web server and then I have a little ghetto uh, switch in between. And there's a video in case it all goes sideways. So uh, if you're looking for the GPS device that I'm, why is it not accepting? Uh, okay. So this GPS device is pointing that I am also in, uh, in Japan right now. You can see that um, all of the satellites are in range. There's quite a few here. They all have a very high signal to noise ratio. If you're being an attacker, don't make this easy for any heuristics engine. This would be complete crap. Uh, if this was re if this was real, so when I stop spoofing, uh, depending on how this receiver decides to re-resolve or not resolve, I haven't quite figured out its logic yet. Um, it's a little bit like uh, gambling. Uh, it, but the satellites in my area I'll typically get about four, maybe five in my office, and they're typically around a signal to noise ratio of 28 to 32 um, dB. So you can you can manage that or snr sorry uh, and you can manage that appropriately so if i see things like that that's that spoofing that's occurring as we are um to do this demo what i'm doing is i'm actually uh doing two things at once one is i have i don't want to break it necessarily okay that's the that tool all right um so as we can see here, uh, I'm running the Spectrum Analyzer with HackRF Sweep. Uh, one of the bugs I detected in it, I'll change the persistent display. This is uh, on, the band, on the L1 band. And it's set up to be only using the one receiver here. 1570, 1580 in terms of megahertz is gonna capture my one seven, or 1575 uh, target range. Now, as soon as I start spoofing again, uh, on that range with a capture, I just quickly got off the internet called circle uh, underscore hacker bin. I didn't feel like creating my own for this demo. And I have my amplifier on. You can now see me spoofing in real time. Now, some people will say, well, that's great. Who cares? You're, you're... Well, if you're in a remote area, you shouldn't have this occurring. You shouldn't have this bombardment of this section of, of the frequency spectrum. And so this should automatically kick off to you that you have an incident, at least a cyber physical one, where someone might be on the perimeters of your facility that is in the middle of nowhere and they're trying to tamper with your devices. So you might wanna be in a heightened uh, situation of awareness. Or uh, you maybe wanna think about this as, you know, let's say cities start creeping up around your remote areas. How do I start dealing with things that are more generic where I'm getting these rogue or, uh, you know, inherit, inherited wireless signals. Recently, I started seeing in my neighborhood, um, I'm seeing uh, port hopping and scanning uh, between 1.2 or 1.2 gigahertz and 1.5. And it's very, very periodic. I can see it from left to right. So it's, it's a, some sort of sweep. 
there's no applications that I know of that. So someone's either doing experiments or there's some devices misbehaving, uh, or it's very possible that I have some engineers in my neighborhood too. So that is particularly useful. Now, you would need to then decode this, uh, and that's possible to do, um, especially given the performance here. And you would just decode out and you'd get all your time. Then you could run your further applications on your time. But in a nutshell, uh, my GPS does indeed think I am in Japan. So when I go to that map, which is the same one I have up there, talk to me. I am in Japan when I should actually be in the middle of Montreal at 1246 Eastern time. So that's, that's, the, that's the tricky part here is there's so much you can say about time, but it's not about location. And, and that's, you really need to think is outside the box of what you can do with, with rogue or errant signals and also the logic that is in those receivers. I don't know, and it might be very possible that you can, you could compromise a receiver that is running a operating system that you could then use as a platform into, into a site. And that's, that's something that's concerning to me. There's been cases where people have done over the air attacks on CR wireless modems, or there's been cases where people have been able to gain access to certain parts of aircraft uh, on some that I think referring to uh, the stuff on the 757. So there is cases where you are able to access systems when you shouldn't be beyond what their regular source of usage was. So kind of on that end note, um, my presentation is complete. And in a nutshell, if you wish to get a hold of me, uh, there's my credentials and I'll pass it over to Joe or the Q and A. Uh, and then I will take this out. I know I recognize this is awkward in Are we still dead? Uh, where did Zoom wander off to? It's somewhere out there. You're still good. So we're still seeing you. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, that's great. That's a, that's a good feature. <laughs> so while Ron's looking around, uh, I don't have a question and answer panel that works for me right now. I don't see anything in chat. Does anyone have any questions um, while we're waiting? I just want to say that was awesome. Uh, I always love getting into uh, signal security and the RF spectrum brings me back to my US Navy days. So I enjoyed that thoroughly. Uh, looking forward to looking at a couple of items in the recording after uh, we're done here and that gets posted. So thanks very much, Ron. I really appreciate it. No problem. Yeah, I don't Let's have see. anything in my uh, Q&A, I don't think. Heck okay, yeah, out. I'm not seeing anything on my end either. Uh, I, I honestly don't have any follow-up either. Again, that was a good presentation. I thought a uh, really good introduction at the beginning to get everyone up to speed and then some really good points for why this matters, especially from a critical infrastructure perspective. Because I think everyone always overlooks that you know, GPS, it's not just about position, it's about timing as well and how critical that timing is for a lot of uh, items that people don't generally think about. Yeah, exactly. And, and there's a lot of them that are deployed, right? Like I was looking at... There's a, a legacy Rockwell, sorry Rockwell, I know you will come after me every time I mention your name. Um, <laughs> it's okay, we have friends over there. <laughs> exactly. There's a, there's a GPS module that fits uh, onto your racks and it's about $4,000, which is excessive uh, for what it is. It's just a GPS receiver. But it's probably going to be very vulnerable because people have sunk that cost into into gps for for their timing needs of their process and they won't upgrade to these extra controls because they've already dumped 4k on something that's legacy so you know all of these old systems and vulnerable gps uh will be still vulnerable moving forward and that's also um going to remain that because there's i forgot how many satellites in orbit right now but there's a there's a good number i think 30 and change at least for legacy gps from the u.s side of things yep. and they will continue being as they are GPS, even though the next generation of GPS is coming forward, uh, the, the US groups that are in charge of monitoring said systems were actually supposed to manage both side by side, uh, managing legacy too. So that infrastructure won't go away. Uh, I'll be curious if someone can do fallback mechanism attacks on that, mm -hmm. which could be interesting and, and it probably will occur, uh, yep. especially if you have, you know, uh, hobbyist devices too on GPSs for like sailboats, stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's all sorts of tricky stuff there. So I'm looking really forward to seeing how this is all going to eventually come through. It's 
you know, we've known about GPS hacking for a long time. Uh, the old HackRF stuff's been around forever, but no one's really, you know, kicked off something good yet. We've seen, I saw, you can Google it yourself. There's a, uh, there's a report saying, I'm not sure if it was in 2018, that over 1800 incidents with GPS were directly the result of Russia in Europe. Uh, you can find it yourself where they pull around this little uh, portable wagon of sorts. And uh, it's got multiple amplifiers on it to basically jam everything in sight. Yep. So you, you can dig that out. That's pretty cool. Um, and you can kind of start thinking about how this will affect infrastructure if we ever got into a land war or uh, some sort of a traditional you know, kinetic based attack as well. Because I mean, the yep. main question of this is, is where are my troops and where they go? Uh, especially during the time of war. Well, this is also going to affect infrastructure as we have uh, more automation and less people moving around as well. So I'm curious on how this will all play out. Yeah, agreed. So we have one question, uh, kind of an equipment recommendation question or looking for one. So if you're exploring this stuff as an upgrade for, uh, in software defined radio, do you recommend the Hack RF1 or Kerberos for either radio direction finding, I'm assuming that's what that means, or uh, bandwidth capabilities? I don't know if you can see that in chat. And yeah, there's, there's a few questions here on that. Uh, just a minute, heads up for a sec. Uh, yeah, so Hack RFs um, are very versatile. I, I like them. Their, their chip, uh, their, their chipset design is not the best in terms of what a good isolated, you know, low noise design should have, but you can make some adjustments. So both of my SDRs have uh, a, a, a temperature compensated control or oscillator crystal, a TZXO. Uh, and then you all, and then they also have Faraday cages in them as well. So I got rid of the plastic cases, particularly when I fly, because I don't want people, especially customs agents or border agents, to see something that says hack on it, uh, because these are these are actually commodity controlled devices. So heads up uh, when you travel, especially if you're going in and, and out of the United States. Um, and then I also have them in aluminum cases uh, as well. So I do have some some ways to kind of balance the caveats. HackRFs are a bit old. Uh, they don't have the, the highest resolution in their ADC. So I think it's, what is it, eight or 10 bits? Um, I don't even think it's 10, I think it's eight. So that probably won't be enough. Uh, some of them also can do up to 12 bit uh, resolution. So you get, you know, you can get more out of other devices. Uh, the, the Kerberos that can do localization with the four antennas, it's cheap for doing what you need to do on particular wavelengths, but they're basically using uh, those you know those uh, little receivers for doing like uh, TV over the airwaves or you know those type of things. Uh, that's exactly what they are. Um, so they're only capable of doing, I think, uh, half duplex. I think they can only receive only. They can't transmit. If I remember, I remember there were some caveats about some of their some of the models, the RTL chips. The the hack RFs are half duplex. So be careful there. That's also why I have two, one to receive, one to send. They're half duplex, so your bandwidth will cut in half. Uh, but I believe the Blade RF is full duplex. Uh, the other thing to be care careful about is how much bandwidth you can get between uh, some of the bands. So some can do like 20 megahertz, or the Hack RFs can do full sweeps between some of their lowest ranges to like six gigahertz. But again, be careful. These are not you know thirty thousand dollar spectrum analyzers here. These are what they are for what you pay. So you will get drop samples. So you want to basically, you know, use the right tool for the right job, or when you can't, uh, use the closest thing to the tool and try to limit the use cases so you don't wind up with a failure on your face. So that's uh, that's a good way to get started with uh, HackRFs. HackRFs honestly are a lot of fun. Uh, they work well in Linux, as you can see, and they have a lot of Windows applications as well. There's Q Spectrum, uh, One Analyzer. There's a bunch of Java derivatives. You can do all sorts of cool stuff, and I think there's a lot of MATLAB type stuff you can do with it too. So uh, take your pick, hack RF is just a good one in the middle if you don't want to spend a fortune. Uh, what else can we do here? There's a bunch of stuff. Oh yeah, some of the SIGINT stuff. Uh, great, great comment there, Michael. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I love playing with the spectrum because I, I see much more um, than, than just looking at GPS. I see this as a, a delivery vehicle or, a precursor to something greater. Uh, so maybe we could ad maybe adjust the, the MITRE ATT&CK framework. I never thought about that, but maybe we should. Hey, Joe? 
Um, Sorry, say again? We should probably add some time, time related GPS stuff for the MITRE attack framework for ICS. I don't know. It's actually a really good idea um, now that you bring that up. Um, yeah, like a PNT sort of section for both positioning and especially timing makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, exactly. So maybe I'll reach out to those group for that. Uh, if you need an introduction, let me know. <laughs> yeah. Um, other comments there? Will a copy of the slide deck be available? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'll just PDF it up. Uh, and there's actually a link. I always put a video on my YouTube channel in case my demo breaks in front of me, which is entirely possible. Uh, so there is a video of it on my YouTube. I can point you to it. Um, yeah, it is an upgrade from RTL SDRs. Those are the cheapo stuff that I mentioned. Uh, HackRF is the better one, but Kerberos is, it's got four antennas in one, so you can do a lot of cool stuff there. Uh, yeah, uh, one last comment there on NIST. Uh, yeah, to be honest, that probably should be an overlay uh, just like the 882 document for ICS, right? So on top of the NIST CSF framework, uh, you could do these overlays. So looking for rogue devices, you could have a little overlay there for, for radio frequency devices or site assessments. Um, you know, you might also want to add a caveat there for guided incident response or penetration testings. Uh, even physical, actually, I would even say on on physical assessments, whether you're doing a FAS ops or cyber informed FAS ops under six two four four three type stuff, you may also want to have some adjustments there too that look for not just GPS uh, spoofing or jamming, but other things like wireless heart, uh, ISA one hundred. I think the Honeywell uses, and there's also various other industrial uh, wireless spectrums. And actually, really cool to do, and I've seen it in one or two places is people doing IP over Motorola FM radios. Uh, so you might want to pick, look for those things as well on some of your remote sites. Um, so there's some really cool stuff there that you can do with SDRs and look for. It. And like I said, I think it was on hack day where they were uh, checking their cable, yeah, audio cables with, with open SDR. So I had a chuckle out of that. You can, you can do all sorts of neat stuff there. So, so enjoy that. Uh, is there anything? For, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Got maybe time for one more question, if anyone has one or if you're seeing one. Uh, so far, so good. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, uh, really appreciate your time, Ron. That was very interesting. Again, I nerd out on this stuff all the time, and I know some other people who I recognize in the room do as well. So uh, really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, again, this was recorded, so if anyone wants to go back and review some of this later, and I know Ron said that he's got the demo posted as well, so uh, plenty of options along with resources to dig into this a little bit further. All right, thanks. Sir. All right. Yep. See you, Ron. See you, everyone. And uh, yeah, thanks again for attending.